So, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here for our project management skill set event and our um, our guest speaker, Dr. John Lannan from the Centre for Project Management, University of Limerick. Uh, Dr. John Lannan works with the Centre of Project Management, the CPM, in the University of Limerick, and is program director of the Centre's online masters in project management, uh, project and program. His research addresses the particular needs of organizations and projects that are aimed to deliver positive social change with a focus on knowledge and information management, stakeholder engagement, accountability, and impact assessment. In recent years, he has worked with a number of non-government organizations looking at how information and communication technologies and information systems can help address challenges at societal or organizational level. Before joining the academic world, John in the IT industry, first as a software engineer and developer, and then as a project manager. Most of this was in telecommunications and enterprise solution sectors, and he's managed a number of distribution center projects with teams situated in locations right across the globe. So I would like to ask John to come and give us his, his uh, project management, evolution of the project management as a professional discipline in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Thank you, John. Thank you, Connell, and thanks to Engineers Ireland for the invitation to, to be here. I think my phone is off, slides are loaded, so we're ready, we're ready to go. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to look at the evolution of project management, as the title says, as a professional discipline in the public, private, and non-profit sectors. Um, I'm not going to give you a, a long historical treatise on the evolution of project management. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, the instrumental sort of aspects of how to do project management. There's plenty of people out there with programs that will explain that to you or, or take, take you away and help you to, to do that. What I want to focus on really is these two words, professional and discipline. Um, so really reflecting where we are now, where we've come from, although I have a nice graphic on, on showing the, the evolution whistle-stop journey through the history of project management that I will show you. I'm also going to draw on some case studies and papers that were presented at a conference we held at the Centre for Project Management in the University of Limerick last October. And the conference was on managing projects in the non-profit sector. Um, and a lot of what was discussed also related to the public sector. And as we realized through the discussions over the two days at the conference, a lot of it also has a lot of relevance in, in the for-profit or, or the private sector as, as well. So, okay, let's, re let's, let's go on a little sort of whistle-stop through two or through project management. Um, you may not be able to, to read this in detail, that's, that's okay. Um, but it starts off by saying, if project management is the act of assembling people to systematically achieve a shared goal, then it has existed since ancient history. And it talks about going right back to the great pyramids of Giza, the walls of China, the Industrial Revolution, all the way up through that, into what it calls the introduction of modern project management. And, and here we start seeing things like the, the Gantt chart. We're looking at the critical path method, um, program evaluation review, work up breakdown structure, all of these tools and techniques that is project managers we, we know and love. Um, it also talks about the, the IPMA, the International Project um, Management Association, and another big one, the Project Management Institute. And these, interestingly, were only set up in the 1960s. 1970, we saw what we now call the traditional approach to project management. The waterfall method is in there. And then we come on to the sort of current era, as, as this diagram shows it, of the, the growth of software applications and, and software tools. And we see methodologies here coming along like PRINCE2. We see a reference to agile project management. Um, and we see that essentially the little note in there saying project management as an in-demand skill. And technology is putting more and more data and more and more information at the fingertips of project management project managers. It has changed how project management is, um, is, is being done. Um, and we'll reflect a little bit more on that um, as, we, as, we, as we go along. But at its core, I guess project management is essentially a system that's intended to deliver one-off under undertakings. To do that, do them on time, within budget, 
within scope. So pretty, pretty straightforward. It's done through planning control of variables like resources, cost, risk, schedule, quality, all of, all of those. Um, and it has spread from a traditional dominance in, in the fields of construction and engineering into a vastly diverse range of, of areas. Um, information technology, pharmaceuticals, healthcare, education, finance, development assistance, the arts, community and voluntary, right across the, the spectrum, any area you could think of. And as I said, the, the rise of the professional project manager has taken place in, in an environment where technology is being used to restructure business processes. It's being used to restructure our organizations as, as well nowadays. There's an increasing emphasis on knowledge as an organizational asset. Although sometimes as an academic, I prefer to think of knowledge in terms of public good, but it is also an asset, an organizational asset. Um, and project management has been promoted in, in this environment, or from, from the 60s largely, I guess, as a universal set of tools and techniques that can be used in any context, in any sector. And these are expected to enable project managers to exercise control over discontinuous work processes, disparate interests of um, stakeholders, I guess, and of course to, to exercise some degree of control, I suppose, over expert or, or specialist labour on projects as, as well. Um, there's a guy called Damien Hodgson, and he, he wrote a paper, it's an interesting paper, back in 2002, and he called it Disciplining the Professional, the Case of Project Management. And he drew on early sociological theory um, about the professions. Um, and he, he basically said there are, there, there are a number of different perspectives on, on the professions. Um, one of them is the, the trait perspective that I've, that I've mentioned there. And, and this one concentrates mainly on compiling a sort of an exhaustive list of the, the features that constitute the core elements of a profession, so the features of, of the profession. Then you have this functionalist approach. And, and the functionalist approach suggests that what distinguishes professions from other occupations is the importance of the expertise or the knowledge um, that they, they possess, that the professionals possess. And they possess that with a view to improving the, the functioning of, of society as, as a whole. In other words, there's a societal value for professional knowledge. Um, and then you have the, the interactionalist um, perspective of, of professionalism. And this sees it not only as being about professional knowledge, but also um, of what the enactment of, I guess, what could be called a professional spirit, a kind of a, it's, it's more like, Conduct is, is seen as um, important in the ongoing construction of, of, a, of a profession. Like, for example, you have um, the pomp and wigs and all of that stuff that goes with being a barrister or in the, the judicial system. Um, and that reflects a sort of professional identity. And then there's, there's a critical perspective. A guy, Turns Johnson, back in the early 70s, said it was... Um, essentially the institutionalized form of the control of, of occupations. So we, we have, so through, through these different perspectives, we can look in terms of features, of knowledge, of conduct, of control. Um, I don't know if any of you ever studied critical theory or critical perspectives, but there's a guy called um, Foucault who had a lot to say about notions of power and knowledge and, and discipline. And if we were to, to draw on him, we'd see, um, Professions is essentially producing certain forms of knowledge to enable a particular ordering of, of the world or a way to make sense of, of the world. So wh what you get from that then essentially is a, a professional, professional bodies of knowledge. And, and you get these contain rules and they have processes and they have practices and they have terminology and so on. And we have these in project management. Um, and these in general, bodies of knowledge are, are intended to or sort of in, encapsulate or embody the truth or, or the reality of, of, what is, of what is done. So the bodies of knowledge would encapsulate or embody the truth or the reality of managing, managing projects. Um, the, there was a woman, Valerie Fournier, who she, she put it like, like this, um, being a professional is not merely about absorbing a body of scientific knowledge, it's also about conducting and constituting oneself in an appropriate manner. Um, so 
the, the, the Foucault emphasized the, um, the norms of knowledge and practices and they could act as a form of discipline, um, he said. In other words, um, instead of discipline coming from um, direct forms of control, which you get, for example, in a regulated environment, um, it comes from socialization or the development of a kind of a, a self-discipline. And, and in the world of project management, this comes through two things. It comes through interaction with other project managers in an organization. And it comes from engagement with the professional bodies, largely speaking. And that may include then the training, the opportunities to interact and to engage with others in, in the profession. OK, so a bit about the, the other word, discipline. Um, let's have a, have a look at, at, at that and the construction of, of project management as a discipline um, and see how this plays out in various sectors. If we're to look at management theory or management literature, um, we see that project management really only came to prominence around the, the 60s, 1960s or 70s. A lot of the groundwork was done in the US defense and aeronautics sector back in the 1950s. Um, but as I said, project management spread then to a lot of, um, a lot of areas, almost every area of, hum of human endeavor. And there are a few reasons, I guess, for, for the, the spread. One of them, of course, is the, you know, the value and the success of the project management approach. It makes sense to, to do the stuff that, that's talked about in, in, in the project management bodies of, of, of knowledge and in, in the processes we've got for, for project management. Another one is the, um, the ever-increasing profile given to it by professional bodies, the likes of the Project Management Institute, the Association of Project Management, the IPMA, all, all of these. Um, and, and these are, touch on those again, again later, those are growing dramatically. Another one is essentially the legitimization of project management um, by academic institutions, um, including my own, I suppose, um, and the number of project management consultancies that have, that have grown up. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned, you have the, the impact of information technology and you have centers of, of expertise and knowledge that are um, sprouting up, e even project management knowledge. I mean, we talk nowadays about project management offices, so even the knowledge um, ab about, about projects as well as knowledge transfer b between and within projects is, is, being, is being managed um, through technology-assisted means. There's another one then that's quite interesting, and it's what I call strategic imperatives. Um, if you look at the non-profit sector, for example, donors tend to give money nowadays um, for projects that will achieve defined outcomes and have a defined or have a specific impact, rather than them funding core activities of, of organizations. So this has also impacted on the, the spread of, of, of or, or the in increased attention, let's say, to, to project management. Um, and, and the two main aspects of the professionalization of project management have been essentially the promotion of accredited programs, and we have the development, as I said, of the, the body of knowledge of um, project management by the professional associations. And these professional associations have mushroomed in, in membership. I, I went looking and I discovered that back in 1992, the PMI, the Project Management Institute, had less than 9,000 members. Today, it says it has 350,000 members. So it's, it's, it's really, it's really mush mushrooming. Um, and the academic institutions have kept pace with, with this pretty much. Um, there are now dedicated courses, as you'll see outside, available from many of the universities and, and, and the training colleges. Okay, so, yeah, so I mentioned um, the development of the, the body of knowledge or the body of knowledge of, of project management. But of course, what we've really got is, is several bodies of knowledge. Um, two two in, in, in particular, two main ones. We have the APM body of knowledge and we have the, the PMI's body of knowledge. Um, now granted, they're, they're broadly similar, I guess, in um, that they um, requires knowledge of techniques, or they have cover knowledge techniques like scheduling, budgeting, and so on, and they, they look at management skills like leadership and coordination and co communication and, and all these. But we're not likely to have a unified model anytime soon. Like the opposite is probably the case. Um, probably thousands of 
at this stage, different methodologies and different variants of um, out there in the world of project management right right now. An interesting one that, that I'm looking at at the moment myself, and I don't know if any of you have, have come across it, is one called PRISM from, from an organization called Green Project Management over in, in the US. This is a kind of a process-based structured methodology for managing change. Quite, quite interesting, highlights areas like sustainability, um, integrates them into the, the traditional core um, project phases and the idea is to try to reduce environmental and reduce social impacts. Again, they claim in, in all project types. So there, there's a lot of development of new methodologies and, and new knowledge in, in relation to, to, to managing projects. Um, so there are a lot of different project management environments out there. Actually, another interesting statistics, I, I looked at the PMIs, one of their last annual reports, I think it was the 2013 one, and one of the first sentences in it was, well, I'll read it to you. 51 million is the number of people across the globe engaged in the management of projects. 51 million is what they say, involved in, in, in the management of projects. So it's fairly reasonable to assume that there are a lot of different approaches to, to projects and to project management if there are that many people somehow in, in, involved in it. Um, and, and because there is such a diversity, um, I think the, the lack of one unified standard isn't such a bad thing. Um, my, my own initial training, my background is as, uh, as, as Connell said, it's as an engineer, electronic, in electronic engineering was my, my first degree. And like a lot of engineers, possibly like a lot of yourselves, I, I tend to sort of take a sort of a, a positivist approach to, to things and to, to want to draw up objective rules and processes that enable me to be able to come up with defined measures of, of success. And it seems to make sense to have one single way, one standard or one set of rules that we, that we could follow in, able, in order to enable us to, to get the job done. Um, but this guy Hudson that I, that I spoke about, he, he argued that the, the various incarnations of project management in areas like construction or software development, social services, all of those, well, they all share elements of a sort of a, a functionalist or objectivist approach to that underpins the field or the discipline of project management. There are certain rules and standards there that, that underpin it. But he argued that we shouldn't think about them as being like deviations from a an ideal model of project management, um, really because th there isn't an ideal model of, of project management. So um, I suppose th th this raises the question then of um, the extent to which project management consists of knowledge and expertise that easily um, exists or that, that exists independently of, of the context. In other words, are the skills of a project manager transferable from one project to another, from one context to another, from one industry or from one, from one sector to another. I suppose if, if you're a project manager who's looking for a job, you'd say they do. Um, but, um, but if they are transferable, it assumes a couple of things. It assumes that there, there is a kind of a technocratic, that, that project management really is like a technocratic objective function that you can do independently of, of the context. And you're saying that it's sort of without an agenda of its own, that it's independent of political values, that it's removed from ethical concerns, all of those things, which isn't, which isn't the case. Um, so I want at this point just to, to speak about two projects or two presentations from that conference I, I mentioned just to illustrate that point. And one of them is um, from the, the public health sector here in Ireland. Um, Carol Glynn of, of the HSE, she spoke about how the project success checklist that um, in her sector, where she was working, far exceeds the, um, what we consider to be the project management norm. And, and she, she mentioned four points. She mentioned the political agenda that was always there in the projects, that, these large-scale projects that, that she was managing. She talked about the policy that was driving the, the project and the expectations of the policy body that was commissioning the, the project. Um, she talked about how the project is expected to, to meet the objectives of a strategic or a corporate plan. 
um, she talked about whether or not there was an agreed framework of delivery for, for the project. Um, all, all of these things. Um, and it, it's, it is clear from um, the, the scenario or the, the case that, that she was outlining that you need to be able to understand these. So you need as a project manager to understand these. I mean, it, it helps you obviously for, it helps with project completion and sign off, but there's a few other things that I've highlighted here that it also has an impact on. It has an impact on the reputation of the organization. And when we, you know, we, we know what the, the um, significance of impact in the context of the HSE or of any projects in the HSE is um, these days. Um, it, it also has an impact on the, the credibility or the ability of the perceived ability, perhaps, of government to, to deliver in the case of, of the HSE. And it impacts on the quality of the project or of the, the service or whatever it is and how it's received in the field. And it impacts on society. There's a social impact in terms of whether the project succeeds or not generally in, in the HSE. And that's a lot to put in the shoulders of the project manager, but, but that's the context and that's the environment in which the, the project manager is, is, is operating. Okay, an another example, this one is from Concern. I'm sure you've all heard of, or you know of Concern. Concern Worldwide, I think, is their, their official um, title. And um, the, 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 the presentation that, that I was just in, intrigued by was on a project which they called Realigning Agriculture to Improve Nutrition, or the RAIN project for short, and it was in Zambia. And this involved working on essentially on several issues with the same target group in the same area, um, de dealing, with, dealing with several issues. And here on the, the left we have what they said about the experience. Um, this was from, from two, um, two, two people who had worked with, with this case on, on the project, and they said that there were numerous barriers in terms of the, this integrated project that they were trying to implement. They talked about policy differences, lack of mechanisms for cross-sectoral and cross-institutional communications and collaboration, we talked about capacity gaps, we talked about inflexible funding streams, um, and all of these were imposing barriers to developing the sort of cross-sectoral approaches that they wanted on the, the project that they, were, that they were working on. Now, despite this, they also said that there were promising results from the RAIN project, and it showed that the types of very challenging integrated projects that they were doing can work and they can succeed. And the factors that they highlighted that underpinned success were, were quite interesting. They highlighted strategic leadership, um, contextual awareness, flexible funding, um, knowledge management, capacity building, and clarity of purpose. Now, of course, many of these are, are more program level challenges than they are actually um, project level ones. But again, they do serve to show the complexity of the environment in which the project manager is working and the challenges that, that the project manager faces as they um, try to, to negotiate and to navigate um, the field. Okay, so. I guess at its heart, project management is, well, it's about a lot of things, it's about planning, organizing, commanding, coordinating, controlling, all of these things. Um, there's another guy I want to quote, Peter Morris, um, back in 1994. He said, project management is the same as any other kind of management, except that one moves through a predetermined life cycle. And a lot of what we do or what we talk about in project management has come from general management. We started with you know, this planning, this organizing, staffing, monitoring, controlling, all of, all of that stuff. And then those added concerns like leadership, knowledge management, managing risk, all, all of those things. But it's also worth, worth reflecting on how project management is. Um, it's about a lot of different things or can be very different things, especially, or even in, in early career as, as a project manager as, as well. Um, you know, you, you, you could find yourself as a, with the title of project manager, essentially ensuring that the right amount of concrete was being ordered for a, for a project um, someplace. 
or if you're working with a, a big international NGO, you could find yourself just reporting to the donor. That's all you do is just filling in the, the sheets and, and reporting to, to, to the donor. Um, so it's, it's a lot of different things. Um, but very often we talk about it. I mean, what we do think about it, what we talk about is we see about it being about some sort of managerial control and sort of imposition of professional discipline on what's, what's been done in a, in a, in a time frame with a, with a specific or particular budget. Um, and of course, there's a hundred and one different things to be to be managed or controlled at the same time. The discipline comes from, as I said, the, the body of knowledge, and the professionalism is is also linked in some ways to an increased level of of control. Um, there's things like specialised terminology that we use as project managers. There's standard techniques that we use, and so on. Um, and the ability to understand and to be able to use that terminology and, and the techniques um, is a result of the training that we get as a professional um, or as a project manager. And they're critical to the success of the projects in, in very many cases as well to be able to, to do this. But there's a problem sometimes with, with this because, um, and I've seen this particularly in the non-profit sector, um, as a professional project manager, you can use the terminologies, you have the techniques, you know to control, to interact with, with the team members, with the stakeholders, with, with all of those on, on an ongoing basis. And sometimes, and that can work very well, sometimes it works really well, but um, it only works well if everybody is, is sort of using the same frame of reference. And it may be that if it's, you know, if, but particularly if it's the same organizational frame of reference in the same organization, it'll work very well because everybody's familiar with the methodology. If it's the same cultural frame of reference, then it's likely to, to work um, as, as well. But if, if your stakeholders are, are say, community organizations, and if you, if you imagine, say, Ghana, a project that I was familiar with, where there was a, a very different um, social reality and a very different um, way of doing things to the way that we as um, Western Europeans might um, go, go about doing things. Um, and if you're a project manager that's been appointed by the international NGO based in Europe in order to, to manage a project down there in, in, in Ghana, you have to avoid making the assumption that your way of doing things is going to be the most efficient and the most effective. And very often what happens is that people say, well, I've got all the terminology, I've got all the tools, all the techniques and everything. This is the right way to manage projects so I can, I can, I can make this project happen and I can, and I can do it. Um, but it's not likely to succeed. I mean, actually, it's, it's probably likely to fail on, on several grounds. The, the OECD have a um, development assistance um, committee and they, they've got five criteria for the evaluation of development assistance of projects. They talk about efficiency, effectiveness, relevance, impact and sustainability. Um, and you again you have to you have to be able to keep all of these in mind in, in, in context of development assistance projects um, for for sure. Um, but the point is that sometimes the um, the the discipline and that we bring from our bodies of knowledge can be a barrier to effective collaboration and to, to, to work with, with team members or with stakeholders. And we get a lot of situations where um, project managers see the organizations that she or he need to work with as being sort of lacking expertise or the word unprofessional. Um, in, in other words, that they, it, they're seen like this because they don't have the discipline that the project manager has been trained to use and that it, she or he expects his sponsor, his donor um, to use, or that the sponsor and the donor expect him or her to, to use. So the, these things can, um, can, can cause problems for, for project management. But we do, I mean, we, we have our traditional um, life cycle for, for a project um, and all the way through this project life cycle project managers do tend to embrace standards they embrace bureaucracy the type of accountability that the sponsors that the donors expect but they can also take a I guess 
call it a more collaborative approach, um, recognize people as human subjects or, or human beings for a start, people who have knowledge of their own, they have expertise, they have motivations that will enable them to get the project um, delivered on time within budget and, and so on. And in reality, project managers actually need, need both. You need, you need the standards. You need to embrace the standards and to be able to, to use those effectively, if only in order to be able to, to keep track and to, to, to report. Um, and you also need the, um, the, the more collaborative or engaged or, or human, <coughs> or less instrumental approach to, to project management as well in order to, to, get, to get things done. Um, so good project management for me relies on it, it's what I call the, the discursive resources of project management and using those in the right way in order to get the job done using the bodies of knowledge, using the processes, understanding the knowledge areas, and, and so on. Um, so project manager has to use certain tools to track and to report progress, to be able to work out costings and all of that stuff. But you also need to avoid marginalizing the people who are outside the professional discipline. And you also need to avoid situations where the self-discipline that you use as a project manager doesn't impose limits to, to your own ability to succeed. Okay, hopefully we're doing, doing okay on time. I wanted to um, end, or I said I couldn't end, I suppose, without, without talking or referring a little bit to, to Agile, because in theory it, it addresses a lot of the, the issues that we have with the, the over-instrumentalization or the over-hierarchical nature of, of project management. Um, of course, Agile is seen as the end of project management as we've known it for centuries. It's actually seen by some people as the end of project management itself. Um, it's um, seen by others then as just a variation on how we, how we do things. Um, but. The thing with Agile is that you, you can be professional and you can be disciplined and you can also be flexible. And um, you know, things like being you know, only accurately planning in detail for the, the nearby or the, the next near tasks, um, involving the people doing the work in the schedule in itself, people choosing their work sometimes rather than it being assigned to them, all that, that, that sort of thing, um, organized small iterations, all of that stuff. Um, it's about feedback and about change. Um, I suppose recognizes complexity, and with it you have the, the traditional goal of optimization and control is sort of making way for learning and innovation, which, as I said, in theory at least makes makes sense. In practice, there there have been some great success stories, obviously in software development where it came from, but it is an area that's um, been looked at now in other sectors, and it's been looked at as an approach in order to help us get over those challenges with the, um, that, that we've had with the sort of over-instrumentalization or the over-reliance um, on um, the control. Um, so the balance, I guess, between control and autonomy having delegated decision making, empowering teams, and all of that stuff, that it can be challenging for, for traditional project managers. Um, in principle, Agile promotes individuals, interactions over tools and processes. Um, but it also, one of the, the, the key things about it is that it changes the power relations within the teams. And that's what, what very often makes it, makes it very challenging for us as, as project managers. Um, a quote to, to finish with um, from Schenker and Javier back in 2007. The classical drivers of project management are no longer sufficient in the current business environment. The traditional model fits only a small group of today's projects. Most modern projects are uncertain, complex, and changing, and they are strongly affected by the dynamics of the environment, technology, or, or markets. So, Ultimately, the, the, the real value in project management as a professional discipline is um, essentially in, in, in the knowledge that, that we talked about, about how to manage projects, and in the ability to be able to react appropriately to dynamics. 
Um, being good managers, also being good leaders. Um, and the features of the, and understanding the features of the chosen methodology are important. Sometimes control is also important, um, not always in the same way, but it, it, it can be. Um, that leaves the, the missing one then, I suppose, is the, the conduct or, or the professional identity. Um, I don't think we've, we've got there yet as, as in terms of um, a project management um, profession, and my guess is that we probably never will. Now that we've got 51 million people around the world engaged in project management, it's probably a little bit late to try to introduce the code of, of that, that conduct that, that, um, um, that I spoke about earlier. Um, but you know what? We, maybe we don't need it. Uh, we just need to be able to continue to conduct ourselves in an appropriate manner in order to be able to get, um, to, to get a task delivered on time and within budget. So hopefully finishing about, about on time and... Yep. Thanks to everybody for your time. So I might take a, a few questions. If I can get this door. Yeah. So, uh, anyone would like to ask a question? Put your hand and uh, we'll get a mic to you. I have a comment. Comment, yeah. Hi, thanks for. Yeah, so is it on here? Um, Dr. Paula Higgins is my name. I'm uh, director of training and professional development, and thanks for your very insightful presentation. I just have a, a comment, maybe that I'd like to share with you regarding, in particular, I suppose the the PMI approach to to project management, and I suppose picking up your comment there of Shen Carr in 2007. That's my maths is right, eight years ago, mm -hmm. and. You know, I would certainly, while some of the comments that, that you have, you know, some of the, the, the points you've put forward, I believe that the PMBOK guide has certainly, with its current edition, and even in the last edition, the fourth edition, has embraced a lot of those challenges and complexities, certain, certainly around a huge importance on putting the onus on the project manager to be very mindful of the environmental and cultural and political issues that go on in the environment of, of, of projects. And also, I feel like the whole provisions for managing change Really, I, I you know I feel it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a very good good fit for a lot of projects, um, as long as the project manager takes on board the environment that they're working in and the cultures of the the people. And I feel that project management is is it's on a journey to to to, to use the, some of the cliche words, and we're at a certain point in that journey at the moment. And the more people that are using the processes of project management, um, the more that would become the way we do things around here. I suppose the way the safety industry has evolved, let's say from 20 years ago, and the construction industry just didn't exist. It was, it, it was now project management has become a way of delivering projects on time, in budget, and um, within the scope that's required, but within a, a changing environment. And I just, you know, would, would like your maybe your views on that. Yeah. Well, first of all, I agree with you that the PMBOK has has made good strides forward in in the last um, the, the last edition, and I think it it is really helpful. And and I do advocate that anybody who is uh, managing projects they, they need to go through the the training of something like PMBOK. So whether it's from PMI training or it's APM training or whatever it is um, accredited that they that they do that. And even better then that they spend a couple of years at some of our universities doing a, a, a master's de degree to get an even deeper knowledge and understanding of those more difficult areas that I talked about that um, you, you don't get from the um, sort of ob objectivist or instrumental approaches that, that we take in, in the bodies of knowledge. Um, I, I, do, I do agree with you that... Um, we, we, are, we are on a journey, and there is going to be a constant evolution, but we're, we're going in, in many different directions now. There was a very interesting talk I had with a um, woman who was involved in a, in a fairly large arts project um, recently, and she said that they had gone through all of the planning, they had gone through all of the initiation, the planning design, the execution, um, had, had just started in terms of what, what they were doing. It was a kind of a huge 
um, performance art and they just threw out all the plans at that stage and um, just went you know by on good feeling and I asked her was the project a success and she said yes it was definitely um, so I said well and and you know, do, do you think you were right, or should you have sort of thrown out all of the, the processes and the plans and everything that you, that you had? And she said, well, it wasn't by choice, but in hindsight, we were absolutely right to do that, because we wouldn't have actually spent time thinking about what it was doing if we had been following sets of, of rules and procedures or a, um, an, an instrumental approach that was telling us what to, what to do. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I do think it's essential that we understand those stages that, that projects are going through, because we do always need to do something at the start of the initiation. We do need some degree of planning, whether it's through an agile or through a, a, a more traditional approach. We do need some degree of that monitoring and control. We need some sort of closeout at the end so that we learn something from the project. We understand why it was a f why, why there, there were failures or... or along the way, what was it that made it a success and, or, or whatever. So we, we, we do need that. That is an area, actually, I think that Pembroke needs to do a good bit more on is in relation to those that um, close out and understanding how we manage to transfer knowledge from one project to, to the next. But I think we'll always be able to kind of nitpick with it and, and help, in its, help in its evolution, find other ways or points that need to be, need to be improved on. Continuous improvement, yeah? Continuous improvement, absolutely. Um, next question, or do you have any, any further queries? Uh, well, thanks for the talk, John. My name is Ed Norton from the Institute of Project Management. And uh, uh, the discussion was around project management. Uh, the, uh, the discipline or the profession, whatever you want to call it, mm. uh, it seems, and it definitely has rebranded itself to, you know, project program and portfolio uh -huh. management. Uh -huh. And uh, whether that is uh, confusing people or not, uh, potentially could be. Anybody, when you talk about portfolios in the financial industry, they don't think about portfolios of projects. However, what I think is interesting is if you look at the statistics, and also in reference to your, uh, your comments on Agile, uh, there are 650,000 PMPs thereabouts. Uh, after seven to eight years of having program management certification, there are about 1,500 people certified in that area. Uh, portfolio management is less than 1,000. And uh, Agile, which has been probably going six or seven years, is 27,000. So sometimes there can be a lot of talk, and that that talk is not necessarily backed up by a hard follow-through and statistics and can be overplayed, I think. you know. Mm -hmm. In, indeed. I mean, I think if I could just um, respond on that, I, I guess I intentionally didn't go into the area of the program or the portfolio and sort of kept it to, to project management because, as you say, we, we get into whole other areas of complexity then in terms of what we, you know, what we're, what we're dealing with and, and managing and understanding, you know, issues around um, value and benefits realisation and all of that stuff at different levels and strategy and strategic choices are relation to portfolios and, and so on. Um, but we, we, we are, I guess, in terms of Agile as well, to say we, we, we're, looking for, um, we're, we're looking for ways to address the challenges that we're facing in relation just at, at project level. And yes, there, there has been a rush towards Agile to, to try to look to see if that is the answer because in theory or in principle it looks like it should but again i mean we have to be mindful of the fact that um, it doesn't always work there are types of projects that it's just not not appropriate or suitable for mm. and it's also quite challenging because as i said it changes it changes the dynamic it's a very different dynamic in a team when you're working with an, an agile approach and and that's something that at an organizational level we haven't gotten our heads around. I mean, to, to, to a lot of extent, you know, as I'm looking sort of from an academic point of view at the literature around project and program management, I see that there's a, you know, that there's very often a disconnect between that and the organizational behavior literature. And, and we're only beginning to try to bridge that gap now in terms of the programs that we're running at, at universities. But we do have a lot, a lot of, of space to go. So even though, as I said, we're, we're taking, drawing a lot from general management, we should be drawing from, from organizational behavior as well in terms of understanding you know, how, how project teams can be more effective. But we're, we're not, not quite there yet on that. Thank you, John. Uh, any more questions? 
going once. <laughs> <laughs> going twice. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Okay. Thank Thanks, everybody. Much. What I would like to do is um, I'd like to go through a couple of things that I've been asked for from Engineers Ireland. So we have um, two events coming up. One is um, uh, organising a project in a distillery. So uh, <laughs> this Friday, the, the day of the vote, um, the Project Management Society are doing a site visit to Tullamore Dew. So if you're a member of Engineers Ireland and you'd be interested in um, joining us on that trip, uh, you can go to the events section on Engineers Ireland and uh, I think it's a 10 euro nominal fee just to cover, uh, I think, the bus fee, as, as far as I'm aware, that, and, and lunch. So, yeah, no, and it looks, like a, it looks like a good event to go. So, bus will be provided leaving from Clyde Road at uh, 9 a.m. and leaving Tullamore at 4.30. So, um, obviously, you'd have to get a vote in somewhere there. <laughs> but uh, numbers are limited, so early booking is advisable. I think we have a couple of spots left, am I right? A couple of spots left. And then th the next event then is uh, a CPD seminar that Engineers Ireland are running in conjunction with the Project Management Society, and it's called a project, uh, Applied Project Management, Understanding People and Processes, and it's on the 30th of June, so it'll be going up on the, the CPD events section of Engineers Ireland, and it'll be running from 9.30 through to 4.30 on Tuesday the 30th of June, and again, in Clyde Road, in this, in this venue here. The overview is that um, the project management professionals bring unique skill sets to any organisation and are responsible for delivery of major infrastructure and services that are in Ireland. So I think there's um, some of the speakers. Then we have our ESB, uh, DAA, Matt MacDonald, and the Centre for uh, Project Management, UL. I, I believe there's more to be announced. Um, I know that Claire was going through some of the, the, the rundown of the speakers. I don't know, Claire, if you want to go through it in any greater detail or... Yeah, so if anyone wants to talk about the, the uh, I think it's ESB sponsored PM event, talk to Claire after us. And if anyone wants to talk about the, the uh, organising a piss up in a distillery, <laughs> no, organise a project in a distillery, talk to Michael <laughs> uh, after the event. Michael's up the top there in the middle. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much, John, for a very wonderful lecture.